Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. Today I'm joined by Daniel Fisher, Director of Product Optimization here at Sweetwater. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about what Daniel does for Sweetwater, how he got here, because he does a lot of really cool things with sound design and the products that we do here. Some very interesting stuff. Hey, Mitch, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for coming in. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to Sweetwater? Um, well, I started, uh, I was playing keyboards uh, at a very young age. I started with organs, uh, mm -hmm. unlike a lot of keyboard players. Uh, so I started with organs and really got into all of the, the tabs and all of the extra features. Uh, when I grew up in the 60s, um, organs were switching from the B3 to the, to the kind with the colored lighted tabs and all the little things. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't know it at the time, but I was learning parts of synthesizers that they were starting to implement on these organs. And uh, so I was really into that. And uh, I remember one day my dad brought home a, an album from, he, or he worked at Motorola. He brought uh, an album home that was completely made of synthesizers. And he said to me, every sound you're hearing did not exist as sound until it came out of the speakers. And like right then, I don't know why, something clicked and, and I was hooked. And as a young kid, I, I used to go to garage sales and try to buy 45s that had synthesizers on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to cut out pictures of synthesizers and put them in scrapbooks. And uh, when I finally, sometime in like the mid 70s, when I finally got a chance to touch a real synthesizer, I knew how to use it. I had read enough about it and knew what every knob was supposed to do. And, um, and it was fantastic. It worked the way that I thought it would. Mm -hmm. and, and I was hooked. And so when I finally got to pick a college, I chose Northern Illinois University because they had this room filled with synthesizers. They had this right. large Moog modular system. They had the Putney VCS3 as used on Dark Side of the Moon. They had these huge electric comp boxes mm -hmm. and everything was modular and you could wire it up and had walls full of cables. And um, I talked the uh, head of the synth department into giving me a key and uh, under the premise that I would vacuum every day and clean the garbage, which I did. <laughs> uh, but then I also brought two or three of my friends in at night at two, three in the morning and we just, we turned off every light in the room except for all the little blinking lights on the synths and went crazy on this thing. And, uh, and I was hooked. Um, Later, I went to, into the Army, mm -hmm. uh, went into uh, military intelligence, strangely enough, and, uh, uh, and I got a secondary MOS in digital communications, multi-channel uh, communications, and uh, I had this Casio had just come out. Um, it was the first portable Casio, had the speaker on it, and I put guitar straps on it, and uh, I was jamming at a rec center in, at an Army base, and we were doing the Who's My Generation, but with Army cadences instead mm -hmm. of the regular lyrics. And some general heard it, thought it was the coolest thing he'd ever heard. Next thing I know, I'm in the US Army band program. And they shipped me off to uh, Virginia Beach, did a year there of intense music study, um, serious practicing. Uh, then I did uh, two years in Europe, traveled all over the place uh, with the 61 piece Army band. Mm -hmm. Then I auditioned for the US Army rock band, it was accepted, and did two years all across the United States with a four-piece rock band, uh, really, really cool and, and very educational. And um, then when I got out, uh, I went to a guitar center and uh, the guy said, well, if you can learn DX7, I'll give you a job. So I bought a DX7, studied that thing, came in and showed it to him. And um, the thing I noticed was I was making more money selling the sounds to go on the DX7 along with the DX7. And, and so people were giving me a hundred dollars for 32 of my sounds mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it was like this is what I want to do I want to make the sounds and um, so I, I got real serious I went to uh, Berkeley College of Music mm -hmm. uh, I got a degree in music production and engineering and then all of a sudden I got really jealous about the synthesizer labs so I took a secondary major in uh, music synthesis and I graduated uh, cum laude in both of those mm -hmm. Uh, got out and decided to start my own company. I called it MIDI Systems Exclusive. Nice. And uh, exclusive was in script. And, uh, and basically, uh, the, the catchphrase was, uh, when the owner's manual is not enough. And my job was just to go to people's houses and, and explain the synths to them. Um, at that time, you could buy sequences, but they didn't have general MIDI yet. So mm -hmm. every time someone bought a sequence, they needed someone to make those sounds to sound right for that song. And... That was my living. I just went from house to house that had this, and uh, it was very exciting. And then one day my father-in-law found an ad for a company called Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. They were looking for somebody to do product testing, and I got introduced to this brand new keyboard called the K2000. Um, and 
it was a dream job in that in order to test it, I had to be able to go to any department and I got to meet these geniuses, the guy who designed the filter, the guy who designed the sequencer, the guy who designed the oscillators and, and ask them, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. And it was, it was just a joy to, to learn everything about this machine and I, I came up with this idea, what if I came up with a patch that used every parameter and with one key press made this sound that you recognized and it was Pink Floyd's uh, On the Run off Dark Side of the Moon. Right. Press that key and you could hear if the synth worked or not. Mm -hmm. Turn the floppy into my boss, and the next day he comes up and says, uh, are you happy here in your job? I thought, oh crap, I'm getting fired, right? right. Nope, he, uh, he hired me as a soundware engineer, I got my own office, and life was perfect, and the guy gave me a list. He said, you need these drives, you need these monitors, you need these headphones, call this guy Chuck. Didn't know who Chuck was, mm -hmm. didn't know where Chuck was, called the phone number, talked to this guy Chuck, and told him I was really into the Kurzweil. He said he was really into the Kurzweil. And uh, next day, all my gear that I ordered is, is here. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. And he said, oh, I'm working on this triple strike stereo grand piano. I said, oh, I'd love to hear it someday. Next day, drives, Cyquist drives show up and he did it. And I listened to it, it was brilliant. And the only thing I didn't like was some attacks I didn't like and I didn't like some of the loops and tuning. And I fixed them all up and I mailed it back to him. And he said, what's this? I said, oh, your piano, I fixed it. He said, what do you mean you fixed it? I told him what I did and uh, he listened to it. And from that day on, we were really good friends. Mm -hmm. we, we were like uh, companions in the K2000. We were just both really into the technology of it. And every now and then we'd talk on the phone and, and just talk about the developments. And one day he made me an offer to head the Sweetwater Soundware Development Facility right. here in Fort Wayne. Right, and that was the first time you were here at Sweetwater. That was the first time I was here at Sweetwater. And I worked here for six years. And over that time, we developed 21 CD-ROMs mm -hmm. of sound libraries for the Kurzweil, the Korg, uh, Alesis, uh, Yamaha, um, uh, the Emu. Mm -hmm. And it was very successful. And uh, toward the end of the six years, uh, Chuck started getting this idea of, of not just soundware, but adding value to products. And we started pushing that. And, um, and then we had a family situation back out east, and I had to move back out there. Mm -hmm. Um, but things took off very well. I, I was uh, given a position as associate professor of music synthesis at Berkeley College and uh, taught there for five years. Mm -hmm. Loved it. I mean, I love that school. And uh, it was very exciting and uh, started a Pink Floyd tribute called Pink Void. Uh, they still exist today. And uh, I was having a real good time, but it just got too expensive to live out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was taking on second jobs to try and pay for things, and the commute was getting ridiculous. And one day I met Chuck at a Mac World, and he said, well, I'll take you back in a heartbeat if you ever want to come back. And man, it didn't take long before that idea. Just it's like, you know what? My life was so much better here, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so I took him up on it. And, but this time when I came back, he said, um, I don't want you to just do soundware. I want you to add value to all our products. Mm -hmm. And he came up with the title, Director of Product Optimization. And... Um, it has turned out to mean a lot of different things. I, I had no idea how many different ways that would go. Um, but like you, um, you know, I do a lot of writing, mm -hmm. I do the videos, I do soundware development, but I do quick start guides. Um, and then just salesmen know that they can use me as a resource. Right. And also I get to interface with all of the different companies and um, it's a dream job at a dream place. Mm -hmm. Right, right, very cool. Very cool. So if somebody wanted to get into, I mean, you have a tremendous background in electronics and synthesizers and years of experience with it, but if somebody's starting out now with today's digital keyboards, how can they learn how to do the kind of things that you do with soundware and, and sound development? Well, you know, you can read about synthesis, you know, and, and you can listen to other people talk about it, and you can listen to albums and everything else. Um, but, you know, like one of my favorite Frank Zappa quotes, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Mm -hmm. And... To that end, it's like the only way to learn synthesis is to get one and to use it. Mm -hmm. And maybe one of the reasons that I did as well in synthesis as I did was when I was younger, I couldn't afford multiple synthesizers. So every time I bought a synth, I had to sell the one that I already had, which meant whatever synth I had now, it had to do my organs, it had to do my sound effects, had to do everything. So even if that synth wasn't good for that sound, I had to learn a way to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would say get a synth, 
and dig as deep as you can into one synth instead of getting 20,000 plugins or 20,000 synths and learning your favorite sound. Right. Get one and learn it all the way through. And I promise that if you know one synth all the way through, every other synth will open itself up to you. Mm -hmm. There's enough similarities as you go from model mm -hmm. to model. Right. Right. Now, I think one of the interesting things today is that the synthesizers come with such good sounds mm -hmm. that a lot of people just use the presets, but there's whole worlds there to be explored. You did a video for us where you had uh, done the Gaia, the, mm -hmm. the rolling Gaia, and the sounds that you get out of that compared compared to uh, what came in the, from the factory. Mm -hmm. Are those the kind of things that you're doing with your value-added things for the, the keyboards, or are you approaching that in a different way? Um, I try to do both. I try to, to, to show more what can be done with things, uh, but also just bread and butter. You know, you can mm -hmm. never... You can never have enough accessible, great organ sounds, great piano sounds. Um, you always want a, a horn section that responds to your fingers that lets you orchestrate. Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things will never go away, as well as wild and crazy sounds and things like that. Um, I think in terms of programming, um, you take something like a, D a, a DX7 or a K2000 that's now what, 15 years old, mm -hmm. and... 15 years later, somebody's made a really, really cool program on it, and you have to say, that sound could have been made 15 years ago on that same box. So I try to think, you know, what, what if some new synth came out 10 years from now, and I said, oh, I could reproduce that on this current synth. Well, then do it now. Right. You know, so try to make future sounds on the equipment you have instead of always, you know, waiting. You know, it, it's the same thing as dig deep in the synth that you got. Mm -hmm. and, and all the other synths will open themselves up. Right, right. So from your perspective as a programmer, are you a bigger fan of analog, digital, modeling, physical modeling kinds of things? Which do you think is the most powerful approach to synthesis as far as the things that you do? Well, I think eventually the modeling will be, mm -hmm. and we're, we're right on the edge now where the modeling is finally, uh, it's finally starting to pay off. I, the, the one thing about modeling is if it does certain things about an instrument perfectly, but then it glitches in a way that's not musical, that's no good for me yet. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're right at a new time now where I'm starting to see things in modeling where there isn't any weird little thing that bugs me. So I think modeling is, is very likely going to be one of the only ways things are done in the near future. Right. Um, but the difference between digital and analog, those walls keep getting narrower and narrower. Um, obviously, the, the key things about analog um, are one, the oscillators are always going. So any lead line that you play is a continuation of a sound that's, that's already existing. You're not restarting a snapshot of something. And you can really hear that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that um, you can modulate something in analog at a speed unable. You, know, you just cannot modulate something uh, in digital without it to start aliasing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, with digital, things are light. You can have 64 voices, 128 voices. Um, and some flexibility you may not always have in analog, uh, but eventually those lines are going to disappear. Right. It really sounds like we need all three. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Daniel, thanks so much for coming in. I sure appreciate thing. you stopping by. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.